Debs created the Socialist Party of America. That's right. America had a Socialist Party. Um, in, in 1900, he created this, and he ran for president five times, five times under the Socialist Party of America. Now, uh, even in 1900, this was an incredibly misunderstood term. Um, it's been a misunderstood term since the inception of the term socialism. Debs ran under the idea of revolutionary socialism. And what does that mean? That means that the worker is not just a constituency. Um, it's, they're, they're not like a, they're not somebody that he's trying to get votes from, um, to Debs for real fundamental and transformational change that is going to come directly from the worker. They were on the foreground of this radical movement. They were on the foreground of this revolution where it wasn't going to come from legislative efforts. It's going to come from the workers themselves, uh, not just seizing the means of their own production, but seizing the means of their life, that they were in control of their own destinies, that they didn't need the party bosses. They didn't need any boss, period, to tell them what to do, how to go about their day, what the society needed. That was all going to be de determined by we the people. So fundamentally, this revolutionary socialist idea was kind of what the idea of this country was supposed to be. That we were, that, that we're all self-determining. That we know where this country needs to go and we're going to take action to get it that way rather than a government system, right? Rather than, um, rather than, than people in Congress and Senate that are going to make rules on our behalf when they never do. They've never made rules on our behalf. And, and anytime the rules are made on our behalf, there are always these half measures with these incredibly massive compromises to them. So that's what he did. He created the, boom, Socialist Party of America. <laughs> In 1901, he publishes a, 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 a paper uh, called How I Became a Socialist, and this is what he said in it. He said, the combined corporations were paralyzed and helpless. At this juncture, they were delivered from wholly unexpected quarters, a swift succession of blows that blinded me for an instant and then opened my eyes, and in the gleam of Every bayonet and the flash of every rifle, the class struggle was revealed. This was my first practical lesson in socialism, though wholly unaware that it was called by that name. An army of detectives, thugs, and murderers were equipped with badge and beer and bludgeon and turned loose. Old hulks of cars were fired. The alarm bells tolled. The people were terrified. The most startling rumors were set afloat. The press volleyed and thundered, and over all the wires sped the news that Chicago's white throat was in the clutch of a red mob. Injunctions flew thick and f fast. Arrests followed, and our office and headquarters, the heart of the strike, was, was sacked, torn out, and nailed up by the quote-unquote lawful authorities of the federal government. And when in company with my loyal comrades, I found myself in Cook County Jail at Chicago with the whole press screaming conspiracy, treason, murder, and by some fateful coincidence, I was given a cell occupied just previous to his execution by the assassin of Mayor Carter Harrison Sr. Overlooking the spot a few feet distant from anarchists were hanged a few years before. And I had another exceedingly practical and impressive lesson in socialism. So he basically points out exactly what the Pullman strike did. They attacked him. They shot at him. 
Uh, they took violent retaliatory actions against him. And, you know, yeah, all he was trying to do was stand up for the working class person. Um, and that was the lesson. That when you have these beliefs, you're going to have a bunch of um, state-driven violence towards you. Um, and like I said, he ran for the ticket he, w with these beliefs in mind, with, with these stories that he shares. Um, you know... He ran for president five times uh, and did fairly well, too. Did fairly well. Uh, one of the provisions that he had, and this is another thing that is going to set him apart from Bernie Sanders, is that he refused to endorse any candidate uh, that was pro-capitalist. Which, I mean, this is an idea that was radical in 1902, as it is in 2002, as it is in 2020, and as it probably will be in 2022. <laughs> I mean, this is a radical idea. He was just like, no, if you're pro-capitalist, if you're pro a bunch of fucking people at the top making money and exploiting the labor of other people, then I'm not going to fucking endorse your campaign. So... I mean, the Democratic Party was scared of him because they were like, wait a minute, you're not going to bend at the knee when we need you to, when we want you to, when we're trying to take your constituents away from you? You're not just going to tell them to vote for us? That's crazy. Lesser of two evils, bro. Lesser of two evils still means you're voting for evil. So... You know, and, and this is this is the difference from Bernie Sanders is he still supports capitalists. And that's an unfortunate thing. Bernie Sanders endorsed Hillary Clinton. He's a big fan of Barack Obama and, and Al Gore and spoke out against Ralph Nader, and, which was uh, all disappointing. He doesn't really say anything about, um, you know, uh, third parties like the Green Party who share a lot of very similar values to what Bernie Sanders should and share a lot of similar values to, uh, you know, uh, Eugene Debs, for that matter. Um, and that's upsetting. It really is. Um, as somebody that supports Bernie Sanders and thinks that he's probably a very good guy and he's probably a very nice individual and really gives a shit about the working class, it just sucks that he has to bend at the knee and support these capitalists that don't care about us, that don't want to legislate on our behalf, you know, that don't want to fight for us on that level. And, and, and not supporting them and, and coming out and, and criticizing them for what they are and criticizing the system that they represent is as radical of an idea in 1902 as it is in 2020. And Debs also called out the duopoly. Uh, this is a 1904 speech. Uh, this is a quote from a 1904 speech. He says the Republican and Democratic parties, or to be more exact, the Republican Democratic Party represents the capitalist class in the class struggle. They are the political wing of the capitalist system, and such differences as arise between them relate to spoils and not to principles. With either of those parties in power, one thing is always certain, and that is that the capitalist class is in the saddle and the working class under the saddle. He basically points out that both parties are run by the same thing. Same things Jennings called out. <clears throat> that Methodist preacher. called out that your Republicans are run by money. Democrats are run by money. That's in fucking 1904. None of that is that much different today. That's how, that's how fucking long these two parties have been corrupt for. And let's not forget the beginning of all this too. 1884, we were looking at Bills that were going to help the working class, both the Republicans and the Democrats at that time, were like, nah, we're just not going to fucking, we're not going to consider that. That's crazy. There are people giving us money right now. And that's 
<laughs> That's how they operate. They've been operating like this for so fucking long. And some people don't realize that, right? Some people don't see that. You, you, you have a lot of people that sit there and say, well, well, you know, and, and they said this in 2016. They said this when Ralph Nader was running. They read, said this when Ross Perot was running. They said this when McGovern became the fucking Democratic no a candidate. Is there's a time for idealism and there's a time for pragmatism. No, I think that it's, they're the same fucking thing. Idealism and pragmatism are the same fucking thing. This is an insane political system. This is an insane system run by rich people that convince a bunch of poor people that one party is better than the other when they fucking have their hands up the ass puppeting both parties. And Eugene Debs just called him out for it in a viable, viable socialist party in the early 1900s. And he all, and I mean, this was like a constant thing that he would, he would go and challenge these capitalist candidates, right? Uh, where are we at? Hold on. Let me make sure. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for technical difficulty here, <laughs> but he would challenge it. So this is from a 1908 speech. Uh, he said the radical and the progressive elements of the former democracy have been evicted and must seek other quarters. They were an unmitigated nuisance in the conservative councils of the old party. They were for the common people and the trusts have no use for such a party. Where but to the socialist party can these progressive people turn? Every true Democrat should thank Wall Street for driving them out of a party that is, on, that is democratic in name only and into one that is democratic in fact. Boom. Boom. 1908. 1908. He basically says the party, the name of the party is false. They don't actually represent any sort of democratic values. And they fucking don't. They just don't. True Bernie Sanders supporter, true people, the, the people that really believed in what, what Bernie had to say, diehard Bernie supporters, should not be bending at the knee. My opinion, should not be bending at the knee of the Democratic Party to support a corporate candidate. Not a chance. There are a bunch of other options that you can choose that nobody's talking about, right? I mean, he may, Eugene Debs is basically making a plea to say, come join us at the Socialist Party, and we promise that we will actually be a voice that represents you, that we will do everything in our power to make sure that you are represented. We will go to, we will go to bat for you. That's what he, that's what he's advocating for. And I think that's, I mean, that's essentially what virtually every third party is advocating for. And people sit there and say, no, it's not practical. <laughs> and, and supporting a party that for, what, 200 years has been pulling the same shit is practical? I just don't understand that argument. I mean, in 1908, we're making this case. And the case hasn't changed because the problem hasn't changed. <laughs> it's the same problem. And we're saying, can we try this one little thing that's different? Come join the Socialist Party. Come join this party that actually believes, it matches your belief systems. Rather than you having to curtail what you believe in to, to make a vote for something that, you know, doesn't even feel right. Why would you take something as, as precious as voting, as, as having your voice count in, in, in this larger system that, it, you know, it, this sacred thing that's delivered to you, that, that you just ha you're just granted that right and give that power over to somebody that is not going to match your beliefs, is not going to really represent you.
This is from a 1911 speech um, when he was up against uh, Woodrow Wilson on the left. He says this, Eugene Debs, uh, we should seek to register the actual vote of socialism. No more, no less. In our propaganda, we should state our principles clearly, speak the truth fearlessly, seeking neither to flatter nor to offend, but only to convince those who should be with us and win them to our cause through an intelligent understanding of its mission. This is what we're, this is what we need to be doing. We need to be creating a coalition. We need to be creating a party that is actually for the people. There are people that are doing that. Movement for the People's Party is doing that. Uh, that they, they've merged with Burn the DNC. There's uh, uh, there's the DSA. There's there's Green Party. There's a lot of people that are doing that. That are trying to create a coalition. They're trying to create a party. And you, anybody that's a true progressive should be joining these movements and pushing back against the Democratic Party that has refused to represent them. So we go on. Voting for socialism is not socialism any more than a menu is a meal. Socialism must be organized, drilled, equipped, and the, pl and the place to begin is in the industries where the workers are employed. Without such economic organization and the economic power with which it is closed, and without the industrial cooperative training, discipline, and efficiency, which are its corollaries, the fruit of any political victories in the worker may achieve will turn to ashes on their lips. It's talking about solidarity right there. Um, that we need to we need to be in solidarity with each other. Uh, <laughs> Which can be hard. Sometimes people are frustrating. But at the end of the day, the bigger goal is to empower ourselves. To know that we're living in a system that truly doesn't represent us. Yet, these, finally now, a bunch of these major, uh, you know, uh, pro-worker activists were were giving Debs discredit. You know, Bill Haywood, Mother Jones, they all started supporting Debs. These are international workers, uh, inter IWW, international workers. God, I can't remember what the second W is. Um, but these these labor these these large figures from the labor movement were supporting Debs. In 1912, um, Debs took six percent of the vote. Six percent, it's a million people. One million people voted for the Socialist Party of America. One million people were basically stood up and said, yeah, I'm for this. I don't believe in what the Democratic Party is saying. In 1912, in 1912 this was happening. Can you imagine if this happened today? Can you imagine if there was a, 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 leg like a viable third party like the Socialist Party of America? And he wasn't the only one, right? The Bull Moose Party um, that Teddy Roosevelt ran uh, against Grover Cleveland. Um, that was also happening at the same time. Now, after the 1912 election, 6% of the vote, by the way. 6% of the vote. That's nothing to fucking laugh at. It's a million people. That's nothing to laugh at right there. Um, in, in 1912, too, that's... That that's a significant amount, um, and I bet you that at that point too, like he's not getting on the radio, you know. He's he's doing speech. He's doing on the ground kind of shit, you know. Um, he I think he was tra he was traveling by train. He was traveling by train, city to city, doing these speeches, uh, and after 1912, the group starts to splinter a little bit and. You know, you have this revolutionary socialist idea of the worker being at the forefront, that it's not this top-down government system, that it's this solidarity, this non-hierarchical system where we are all determining our own futures. Uh, you had a bunch of racists that 
started showing up in the in the socialist movement um, and Debs pushed back against them. He he didn't really want them to be the representatives of the Socialist Party. Uh, and eventually, in 1918, um, we get to the the one of the most famous uh, speeches that Debs gives. It's over two hours long. Um, I will be honest that I've not read the whole speech. I want to. It's a it's a long it's a long fucking speech, you guys. Uh, and, and, oh boy, only has so much time in a day. Uh, but I have heard, uh, segments and parts of the speech that, uh, really got him in trouble. And in 1918, in the Canton, Ohio speech, um, he basically points out that the ruling class uses the subject class or the working class as cannon fodder for their wars. It was a huge speech that was super against the World War One. That all of it, not just being like America shouldn't be involved, or it was just like why the fuck are we fighting wars when all wars are is a is 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 the middle class being used as cannon fodder for the rich? Uh, that's not cool, you know. And he point and one of the things he points out is is the subject class doesn't determine the uh, the uh, the treaties. We don't determine when peace is declared, and we don't determine when war is declared. That's all done through. Um, you know, the elites, the the robber barons, the bosses. They're the ones that determine all this stuff. And, and that's what they do, you know. And again, that's something else um, that we still see today. Name one time, name one time where the working class has actually determined whether we need to go to war or not. Name one time that the working class has actually determined what the, the, the negotiations of peace should be. What are we going to get out of it, right? If, if America won the war, where are we on the negotiating table of peace? It's never happened. Even 9-11, right? You'd be like, oh, well, everybody wanted to take down terrorists in 9-11. Krish, that was important. Was it? Was that you? Did you guys make that decision? Was there a vote? Was there a national vote that was called in? Or did somebody just say, well, terrorists want to kill your family and eat your babies? And you were like, well, you got to go to, yeah, kill whoever you need to. Also, take some of my freedoms. Do you want a couple of them? Because we'd love to give you um, a, a lot of them. Also, we're going to turn to be super xenophobic, but we're going to be like, we're not really racist. Okay, we just want safety. So we have to punch all brown people in the testicles. And that's how you prevent terrorism from happening. I'm doing my part. We're going to do that. That was the decision. They made that decision. They used fear as a way to just get into an illegal war again. So that's what the core of, of that 1918 speech was. It was this immensely anti-war speech. And two weeks later, he was arrested for violating the Espionage Act, which is an act put into place by Democrat Woodrow Wilson, good old Democrat, violating cons the Constitution, because the Espionage Act basically says that you can't say shit about the American military. You can't say anything uh, about not going to war during a wartime. You can't say anything bad about the military. You can't say anything bad about uh, the government or anything. Uh, and that goes against... Freedom of speech, expression, petitioning the government, and peacefully assembling, which is what he was doing. In 1918, there was an assembly. This wasn't at, like, this was at a rally that they had gotten together. And you arrested somebody for expressing their opinions. That's authoritarian. And a Democrat put that into place. Ten years is what his sentence was. For pointing out the reality that the working class people are used as cannon fodder for the rich. And we've never been involved in peace talks or declaring war. And maybe we fucking should. If you're going to use us as cannon fodder, maybe you should ask us whether we, we need to be in war or not. But in prison from the Atlanta Penitentiary, he ran for president again in 1920. He ran as inmate number 9653, garnering another 1 million votes. He got another million votes from prison. If he would have ran, if he would have ran 
at like without being in prison, imagine how many votes he would have gotten. Imagine if, if he wasn't handicapped by being in prison for no fucking reason, by being a victim of, of uh, a, a unconstitutional law. He would have fucking wiped the floor. America would have been so different. If he would have fucking won, if he would have given Woodrow Wilson a run for his money at that point. Holy shit, dude. Holy fucking shit. One of the, th- one of the big fights that he uh, put forward was a fight for prisoner rights. Right. So he gets out of prison. Uh, in 1926. He uh, uh, he fights for racial equality against white supremacy. He he penned a, um, an an op ed piece essentially um, about a a hanging that happened in Kentucky of uh, of a black man. Um, and you know one of the things he points out was uh, capital punishment is delivered a lot quicker to black men than it is white men. And, you know, that there is Christian white supremacy in this country. 1926, he's calling out all this shit. Again, we still see these problems today. We're still seeing a lot of this shit today. And he was calling that out. Had we been a more... Had we gone with, with a president like him? Instead of instead of a, a Mr. Espionage Act, Democrat Espionage Act? Maybe we wouldn't be as paranoid of a country willing to give up our rights for illegal wars as we are now. I don't know. Maybe we wouldn't have a, 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 a system that has prisons for profits. Maybe we wouldn't have a system that uh, convicts more black men for nonviolent crimes than white people. <laughs> Maybe we would be able to accept that we have Christian white supremacy. And, and uh, the biggest example of that is white Jesus. Dude, Jesus was in the Middle East. He would be my shade of skin color. That's right. Y'all worship a brown socialist. Uh, he died later in 1926 of cardiovascular problems that he developed um, from his time in prison, uh, is what it said. And, uh, no, this guy fought for a lot of things that, that we still see today. Um, I think he is a, uh, he's not taught about, talked about in history classes. Um, he's not really talked about a, in, you know, the, the only reason we know about him, I, you know, is because of Bernie Sanders. And I, I, I will give credit where credit is due. Uh, and this should be part of our history. You can't talk about World War I without talking about Eugene Debs and Woodrow Wilson and the Espionage Act. Kids in school need to learn about this shit. They do. And, that, and, and the reality is that they won't because what this teaches you is to stand up for your rights. What this teaches you is that uh, sometimes your leaders are flat out fucking wrong, and they ha- and it doesn't matter what party they belong to. Because guess what? Eugene Debs went to went to bat for the working class man against a Democrat, Woodrow Wilson, who put him in prison, and a Republican, who also put him in prison, and that's how both parties operate. So what is the difference? There's no difference. They both are corporate parties, and they have been for over 200 years. Why are we still supporting them? So that's a question. That's a very difficult question to answer, right? There are, op- op- there are opportunities and options out there um, that are a little bit different. And I'm going to end uh, uh, today with reading two different quotes uh, from Eugene Debs. Um, this first one is, uh, too long have the workers of the world waited for some Moses to lead them out of bondage. He has not come. He will never come. I would not lead you out if I could, for if I could be, it, for if you could be led out, you could be led back again. It would not have you make up your minds 
that there is nothing you cannot do for yourselves. You do not need the capitalist. He could not exist in an instant without you. You would, not, you would just begin to live without him. You do not need everything, and he has everything. And some of you imagine that if it were not for him, you would, not ha you would have no work. As a matter of fact, he does not employ you at all. You employ him to take from you what you produce, and he faithfully sticks to hit this task. If you cannot stand it, he can. And if you don't change this relation, I am sure he won't. You make the automobile, he rides in it. If it were not for you, he would walk. And if it were not for him, you would ride. It's very important because that's basically saying stop looking for the one leader, right? Same thing as him saying a, a, a vote for socialism is not socialism in and of itself. So just because you brought it into the mainstream political conversation doesn't mean that you have brought socialism into the world. You have to continue fighting for it and that fight only exists if you let it power given to these capitalists comes from us letting these capitalists do exactly what they want um, and not holding them accountable, not holding their feet to the fire, not saying, you know, we're, we're not going to fucking take that shit anymore. And this is what he says is the future for socialism. Under socialism, no man will depend upon another for a job or upon self-interest or good, uh, goodwill of another for a chance to earn bread for his wife and child. No man will work to make a profit for another to enrich an idler, for the idler will no longer own the means of life. No man will be an economic dependent and no man need feel the pinch of poverty that robs life of all joy and ends finally in the county house, the prison, and the potter's field. Industrial self-government social democracy will completely revolutionize the community life. For the first time in history, the people will be truly free and rule themselves. And when this comes to pass, poverty will vanish like the mist before the sunrise. When poverty goes out of the world, the prison will remain only as a monument to the ages before light dawned upon darkness and civilization came to mankind. It's very powerful. A lot of what he talks about in that, um, some of it has been addressed with uh, resource-based economy and, and the Zeitgeist Movement and the Venus Project. Um, I did a big video thing about them. You should, if you guys want to go look that up, I'll probably end up talking about those again at some point. He's talking about no hierarchy, but finding true definitive purpose in what your life is as, as a person, as a human. His revolutionary socialism idea is a humanist idea is an idea that says that we don't need to be interdependent on each other for financial gain or employment or whatever. We can all be an encouraging force to help each other find our own purpose in this world. <clears throat> Which is very important because I don't think that's the way that, that we run our world. I think finding purpose, finding meaning in our lives and in what we do, how we can be a contributing member of society is far more important than trying to um, acquire wealth and make a shit ton of money all the time. Um, that's a completely different way of thinking. And it's a less profit-driven way of thinking. And that's really what Eugene Debs represents. This guy was around 100 plus years ago and has more progressive ideologies than a lot of uh, 
people that claim to be progressive. Um, how do we achieve this is going to be up to us. And the first step is uh, coalescing as a community, standing in solidarity with each other, realizing that we have the power and realizing that sometimes doing things uh, for for just the good of humanity good and the good of community is more important than trying to make a profit off of that good. That doing something truly good is not a not a bottom line incentive or a profit incentive. Doing good for humanity is just that. It's doing good for humanity and it should just be left at that. If that appeals to you, then guess what? You might be a revolutionary socialist. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a like and a subscribe and a share. Share it out with your friends, your enemies, whoever you think would enjoy content like this. I'm going to be putting out videos like this every single day. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel uh, and make sure you hit that bell so you get all the alerts from all the videos that I put out there. Uh, and, uh, and if you, if you have the means to, uh, please consider making a, a donation. I know we are all in tough times, but if you, if you can, uh, you can become a sustaining member or make a one-time donation at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. You can check out various different ways of becoming a sustaining member or just make a one-time donation. Uh, while you're on my website, you can also check out all of my past comedy albums, which are available on all of your favorite streaming and uh, downloading websites, if that's that's if that's a way that you can you say that, uh, <laughs> but they're also available on Bandcamp, which uh, right now is giving the most back to artists. Uh, but also on my Bandcamp, they are all available for a pay what you want. If you would like to enjoy some live stand-up comedy albums from me, and you don't have the means, if you're in tough times, that's totally fine. You can download it for free. Go ahead and get it for free and enjoy it. Uh, or if you do, and if you want somebody else to enjoy it, you can get it to them as a gift. Uh, that's also a, a recommended thing. Uh, but most importantly, thank you guys for tuning into this video. Um, thank you guys for, for all the people that have already donated, that have already become patrons. I really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. And uh, until the next video, we'll see you on the road. Thank you, guys.